Okay, uh, welcome everyone to uh, my fourth webinar, which I'll be covering an ultrasonic drive circuit. You will understand and can build a, a guide for non-electrical engineers. If at any time you guys can't hear me, or if there's any problem, please write in the chat. Uh, but the topics I'll be covering are the basics of ultrasonic transducer drive principles, um, building a drive circuit from two components. Uh, and I found that this to be a very useful exercise for myself um, uh, when, when I did this. It just, just because a lot of the circuits have so many components, it's hard to understand what's happening. And when it's hard to understand what's happening, you're kind of, sometimes you just feel like you're assembling components and not really understanding uh, what's what's going on. Um, and also, I'll be, under, I'll be talking about how the circuit um, works um, throughout the process um, and, and what different design parameters. So, um, I first want to get started with the question. Oh, well, well, actually, firstly, I have it in my slides. I always forget to sell myself. Uh, so a quick thing from my consulting work. Uh, my consulting work, um, I obviously serve ultrasonic transducer uh, companies who are developing these transducers and systems. Uh, oftentimes, my clients are folks who are new to transducer engineering or they lack specific expertise that they need help with. Um, my uh, work o always results in uh, production success with less time, less money, less stress, and there's actually also more confidence in the design. Uh, I specialize in bolt clamp transducers as well as many other types of transducers as well. Um, and I provide uh, simulation services, advisory, and also um, measurements regarding piezo ceramics, quality control, and other aspects of characterization and measurement strategy. All right, so if you want uh, more information, uh, visit my website and schedule a call if you are a, uh, if you are a company. Um, so I want to actually ask everybody, and please use the chat box uh, for this question. Why does it feel like, you know, for those of us who aren't perhaps like formal electrical engineers or are very familiar with drive circuits, why does it feel like the, the circuits are a black box, like you don't understand uh, what's happening? Uh, or is this something that you have, it's like, it's like a box or like a circuit that you just plug into your transducer and your transducer works or it doesn't work? Uh, uh, wh why, why does it feel like that? What are some reasons why, like I guess, the understanding of 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 such drive circuits are not are 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 difficult for 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 us or for for some people? All right. So anyone in the chat wanna wanna jump in? Uh, but I'll I'll also um, list some reasons as what, what that personally I think. Um, so first of all, there are, are a lot of components. So if you see in this circuit here uh, that I have on the screen, uh, there are many, many components uh, here, and it's kind of hard to understand what's happening uh, and what's what's exactly going on with every single component going on there. And if you think about like a bolt clamp transducer, where you have like a bolt and you have a back mass and you have a few ceramics and you have a horn, like it's it's relatively there's like five or six components. It's relatively easy to understand and 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 comprehend. However, for a circuit such as this, where there's many many components, multiple traces, two sides to the board, um, you know we have uh you know we have the uh, microcontroller as well. So we have like there's sometimes a lot of logic going on uh, that's behind the scenes that's programmed. So it's it's other aspects. There's also the thing that's different with between mechanical parts and electrical parts is electrical parts you are explicitly handling time. Although you can argue that resonance, uh, you know, has an has a uh, 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 has an has a relationship with time. But in in circuits, you definitely explicitly handle time and currents and phases, and it becomes a lot more intense. Um, and, you know, someone wrote in the chat, uh, there are a lot of components embedded in a, in a single chip. That's why it's kind of hard to understand. So when, when there's like one chip, it's not really, it's hard to understand what's going on in the chip because sometimes a lot of components are integrated into one, uh, one device. Um, like for example, uh, you know, microcontroller is a good example, but there's also other like op amps and other amplifier circuits. But today we're going to be assembling a circuit with very as, like fundamental components, as fundamental as you can get practically in modern electronics. And therefore, I really hope that uh, we'll walk away with a good understanding of how these devices work. At least start with the building blocks of how they how they work. All right. So let's. 
go ahead now and talk about the basic drive principle of a piezo ceramic. Uh, so the circuit diagram for a piezo ceramic is that of an oscillator. Uh, so you can draw an oscillator like this, um, or you, you, many of you are, might be familiar with you know the LCR circuit for a piezo, uh, but this is basically that, uh, kind of in one circuit diagram. Um, so let's say we want to power the piezo device. Let's say it's like a, a let's say it's a disc or something. We want to power it with five volts. So we attach a power supply. We have five volts, and we apply those five volts. Now the piezo, depending on the polarity of the piezo, it'll, it'll either contract or expand. Um, so we have five volts on the piezo. We have it on some type of electric field, and therefore the piezo material or transducer will contract or expand accordingly. Um, but then we also, we know that we, for many applications, you want ultrasonic drive, you want to utilize resonance, you have to drive it at a frequency. Um, so my question to you is that what happens if we take out the, take out that, like, let's say we, re we replace this with a switch. Uh, and what we did is that we opened the switch. So, and you, let's say you open the switch at a frequency of, let's say, 40 kilohertz. You open and, somehow, you open and close the switch at a speed of 40 kilohertz, you know, would the ceramics start oscillating? Uh, and, you know, would, would you achieve resonance? Let's say the resonance frequency was also 40 kilohertz. Would it actually resonate? And the, and the answer is that no, it wouldn't resonate. It would stay at 5 volts. Because this 5 volts, the piezo is a capacitor, so that 5 volts is going to stay on the piezo ceramic despite you connecting and disconnecting the power supply. Now there's no longer any current passing. So this is one big concept is that just disconnecting and connecting your ceramic to full voltage is not going to cause oscillation. You actually have to do something else. So like this disconnection and reconnection does does not, you know, does not equal does not equal oscillation. However, you have to actually think about this in terms of discharging. So when you think about driving a ceramic at a frequency, you have to charge and discharge it at that frequency. So that's that's the essential, very essential like concept of how this works. You have to discharge and charge, uh, not connect and disconnect, because the piezos are essentially a p a, a, a capacitive um, uh, transducer. So let's let's take a look at um, uh, charging and discharging. And let's just do this manually. Um, so we have our oscillator ceramic, and we have um, our device here, right? So that's going to create um, expansion or contraction. But let's say after the after we do that, so this is state one, and then state two. I'll draw that there. You disconnect your power supply. And you you remove the wires and you put the wires like this. So you have these wires here, and you have and you and you connect the terminals together. So now the voltage potential is truly zero across these you know across these uh, planes. So the delta V equals zero. This is a delta V equals five volts. Let's say this is five volt supply. Um, so now you have two states, state one and state two. Now you are actually achieving five volts and zero volts. Before, in the in the previous example, you were not achieving zero volts. This, you know, state state one was five volts, and state two was also five volts. Because if you disconnect a a capacitor from a power supply, it's going to keep its charge unless you discharge it, which is what we're going to be doing. So here, you let's say you disconnect the power supply and you charge and you discharge the the the, the capacitor by connecting the leads, or um, then you would have two states. In state one, you would have the five volts. In state two, you would have zero volts. And if you just keep oscillating that at a high frequency, 
then you'd be good. However, we have to do this at the resonant frequency, which are which are usually are in the kilohertz range for piezo ceramics. Um, you know, typically the golden number that's used for a lot of devices is 40 kilohertz. So there's no way we're going to be uh, connecting and disconnecting uh, circuits manually with wires at this at this at this uh, speed. Uh, there's not going to be a mechanical option. Uh, even elect electromagnetic relays that you that you hear when they click. You know you might hear clicking from different electronic uh, devices or power electronics. Um, uh, though that clicking is actually a relay uh, making a switch in that circuit, that's not going to be fast enough, f nearly fast enough to provide 40 kilohertz and I'll do all this disconnection. And there, you know, there must be a simple a way to make this happen. That's what I'm going to be explaining today. What's the simple? What's the most simple circuit to charge and discharge a piezo ceramic? All right. So again, um, the transducer behaves like a capacitor because it kind of it is one and it needs so it needs to be charged and discharged this is really fundamental um if it's obvious then pat yourself on the back uh but if it's not obvious well you've learned this basic uh this basic fact that just disconnecting your device will not at, at a certain frequency will not uh, will not uh, cause oscillation. It'll just keep that voltage. And yeah, if any questions come up, uh, please write down in the chat. If, if it's more appropriate for q and I'll just let you know. Uh, but if it is relevant to the discussion, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer it because it makes for a more, uh, more engaging webinar. All right, so going forward, let's just talk about the general construct of a drive circuit. Um, now, there may be slightly different ones, but let's just talk about very general. You have a DC power supply. Um, you may have started from AC and then you converted like the wall power to a DC power. But usually, let's let's for our purposes, we'll start from a DC power supply. Let's just call it like 24 volts or something. Um, and then we put that into AC. So usually this in this case, it's, it's at your frequency. You make that DC power supply into AC, and that's what we did here. Um, we made this into an AC five volts. Uh, if you did this manually and you started like pressing a switch, you could probably let's say press it like uh, three times a second or something like that. So it could be like maybe not even that fast. So it, you, you'd be basically press if you had a switch that you were pressing a button, you maybe three hertz maximum you could do. We need a lot faster than that, and the relay would probably go into like say hundreds of hertz, perhaps. I'm not sure exactly how fast a relay can can switch. But in this case, we we are let's say we're going with 40 kilohertz, and we want that AC voltage to be at 40 kilohertz. Then we do two things after that. Um, we can we can amplify. This is optional. We can amplify that voltage, and this is what I won't be talking about today. How do you amplify the voltage? I won't be talking about that, but that's often uh, the case, and it's achieved in different ways. Uh, most many times, it's achieved through uh, a transformer. Um, but then we drive, then we, we use that signal to drive the transducer, and. Typically, uh, modern drive systems use feedback, but not all of them. Some of them have a, uh, uh, an oscillator circuit itself, which kind of has self-feedback. Uh, but uh, but if we're using a microcontroller and we're, we're doing ex things explicitly, um, there'll be some feedback part that, that that's some some aspect of the circuit that's measured in current or voltage and phase. Um, and then and this is achieved through measurement in the microcontroller. Um, and then that's both fed back usually to it can be fed back both to the dc or to the ac parts of the circuit that govern those two uh govern those two aspects um so that's the essential part of the drive circuit what we'll be covering today is this the dc and the ac um uh controls well, the DC and the AC AC components, and how do you how do you and you can actually use this to directly drive the transducer uh, if you choose. So now let's talk about the most uh, simple drive circuit. So we, we drew a couple circuits before. This is a ground there. Um, it's an oscillator. And we talked about this just charges the transducer with five volts. It doesn't do anything past that. It's kind of static. 
And we also talked about the case where, well, what if you had a switch here? This would also not work. Um, and then we, we spoke about the, another, another example, if you remember, where we connected and disconnected the wire. Uh, but what if we put the switch here and we put our transducer here? Now we may be we may think that oh this could actually work because this could actually provide that char pathway to discharge the terminals well and while the circuit is open it'll charge um, the the transducer but the only problem is when this is actually closed when the switch is closed then then the power supply is going to be extremely um, drained by that short circuit uh, condition. So it's in a practical circuit, you may even get away with it, like just for demonstration, but it's going to really be taxing your, uh, your power supply. And it's just, uh, uh, it's just a, a really bad solution. Um, so let's, let's go over what a good solution or a better solution uh, might be. So we have, so we're still going to come up with, use this basic circuit design. So it's based off of this circuit that we had earlier, but there'll be one important change here. And the important change is that, I mentioned that the, the issue with this is that the current is just gonna go all the way through that branch of the circuit. Um, so the change I'm gonna make, because there's no resistance, like V equals I R, you know, if the R for this circuit branch is zero, then the, current is going to be huge like you know if the if the if the resistance was theoretically zero and you had five volts you would have an infinite number of amps although it's it's, it's never truly zero because there's also power supply resistance um but what we can do here is we can put a resistor there to limit the current flow and you can put this resistor in multiple places, but for the for the sake of just argument right now, we're going to put our resistor right there. And we're actually going to use in in practice. You'll see in a second, in a, in a few moments, I guess, or a few minutes, you'll see I'll put a hundred ohm resistor uh, at that part of the circuit. So this will actually uh, fulfill our desire that that you know the capacitor will charge up or our piezo will charge. And it'll also provide a free path to discharge um, as well. So this actually fulfills both requirements. It can charge and discharge. There's only one part about this that's not good, but it's not terrible for our, at least our, our sake of construction of our circuit, that when this is closed, when we do have closure here, there will be uh, current draw there. So if this was a 100 ohm, ohm resistor and this was 20 volts, um, we would have 200 milliamps of current in the closed state, even though it's not doing anything. So it's very inefficient to have this during the closed state that 200 milliamps is flowing through from your power supply to ground. It's and just going through a resistor, just making heat. Uh, it's not efficient. Uh, it would be a terrible design for a battery power transducer. But the the actual topology that I'm showing today, if you did have like voltage from 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 the wall, uh, you know, it basically you're not concerned with power. You could very well design the circuit I'm describing today into a commercial device. There would be no there would be no specific problem with it, except that it's not very efficient. Uh, but it's not. But it still works, and it's not going to tax any of the components more than they can bear. Uh, it's uh, so basically this this hundred ohm resistor is current is a current limiting resistor. Um, to, in order for the power supply not to draw too much current. Okay. So drawing that again, real quick. And then, uh, oops. I'll just, over, I'll just overdraw my oscillator. Um, again, if when we have our open state, and when this when this uh, when this is open, we'll have our full voltage. Let's call it 20 volts now. This is the open state. In the closed state, we'll have 
zero voltage because when this circuit is closed and the, then the terminals are shorted um, and it'll, it'll continue like that. Uh, one thing to note is that because we have a capacitance of our, of our transducer and we have a resistor, we do have an RC time constant related to how fast this uh, voltage supply is able to charge up your capacitance of your transducer fast enough. So this is kind of getting to a little bit of the analysis of this design. Um, um, so what you would actually find, um, let's just draw this as a straight line and draw this a little bigger just for demonstration purposes. Um, you would actually find that your, your voltage would, would kind of peak up, peak up. Um, now, if you if you had the resistance low enough and the capacitance properly matched with that, you would actually not really see too much of it. You may see like a very quick increase. But however, on the closure side, on the way down, you don't get this. And the reason you don't get a time constant on the way down is because the resistance is close to zero in this path. Um, so you don't get a you don't get RC time constant because R C R is practically zero, so you do have kind of instantaneous response, which you'll also see actually in the experiments that I'm going to show. Um, so speaking about the RC RC time constant, and just, just for the sake of a little bit of circuit analysis, uh, where we're trying to achieve a maximum, and you know, the, like the 0.7-ish um, criteria about the time constant and, and, and how that's that's what it represents. So let's say we had a criteria that uh, that the target frequency, that the time constant had to be um, uh, had to be, you know, five time, five, at least five time constants had to be accommodated in that frequency. So that'd be like the one over one over the frequency. So if you had um, so this would be the, the equation would be time constant equals five times one over the frequency. Um, so if you had a capacitance of 10 nanofarads and you had a resistance of 100 ohms, um, you would actually have a time constant of one, one microsecond which is it related, which goes into like, if you, if you take a reciprocal, you'd have one megahertz. Um, and if you had this five, five X factor, you could say the fastest you could do this, you could run this circuit is in 200 kilohertz in order for that five time constant to be related. And now there's no rule with five time constant. I just made that up, but just as an example of what we could, uh, of what, what, how we might design the circuit appropriately, um, for this uh for for this result all right and again for the other side for for the for the side where we're going to drain this drain the 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 charge and and kind of um, cancel it out there's no resistance so the time constant is zero so practically you will be able, it's not going to be a limiting factor in your, in your circuit design if you were designing a circuit with this purpose now I would not recommend designing a commercial circuit with this specific circuit but it's uh, it works there's nothing that says it, it, it works completely well and it provides the AC frequency uh, that you're looking for and it could even be used um, in a more formal circuit, except there may be a little bit better designs uh, to uh, to accomplish this. But uh, for the per I wanted today to present a circuit which is easy to understand, even if it's a little bit inefficient. It, it explains all of the basic ideas about charging and discharging and how you could practically make that circuit. All right. Now here's a here's a snag here. Whereas like you know I was drawing this like this kind of switch uh well there's no such switch like that um that just you're not going to be pressed it's not a press button a push button switch or anything so what do we use to switch something at 40 kilohertz we can't use a relay um electromagnetic relay um so what do we exactly use so we have to use a transistor so as an electrical engineer i was a mechanical engineer undergrad i i can at least speak you know, if, if someone here also had a very formal kind of mechanical engineering work and background, the word transistor is kind of a fuzzy term. Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's just my experience. But uh, before I really looked into drive circuits, or if somebody had I guess hobby electronic experience, they may have some experience with transistors. But it was a kind of a kind of an odd term. Um, 
so I'll, I'll I want to take some time to explain it in case there's there's any uh, misconception about or, or what exactly is it. So the a MOSFET is the most common type, and I'll, that's what I'll actually be using today. Um, so there, this is where electrical engineering gets very hairy because there's so many types of transistors and devices, and they have huge, huge data sheets with graphs. They have like a lot of parameters with voltages and charge and re referencing terminals and it's 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 sometimes very hard to choose components and it kind of gets overwhelming at, uh, if you really open yourself up to tr um, all of the transistors and devices that exist um, so there are common ones that are that are more popular and typical uh, but this is one area where um, electrical engineering is is much different than uh, I believe mechanical engineering uh, or other types of uh, engineering uh, because the the specific components are very like they have a lot of specifications and those specifications will be very relevant depending on how demanding your application is uh, so I'll explain the transistor or at least the MOSFET for what we are uh, after today so there's three terminals Um, and I'll just draw, I'll, I'm going to draw a very simple figure. Um, this is not exactly what you're going to find in a circuit, in a true circuit diagram, but this is how I'll draw it. So there's a terminal called the gate and the terminal called the drain and the terminal called the source. Now don't worry what drain source means. Gate is kind of makes sense because if you put, because these, th there's obviously a connection that needs to be made. There's a, there's like a theoretical switch here. Um, so um, by charging the gate, by applying voltage to the gate, you actually close this. So it's basically a voltage controlled switch. You apply because voltages you can change very quickly, uh, but uh, so in order for you to be able to close that switch, and there's also no mechanical components. All of this is uh, like silicon uh, technology, and it's all solid. It's solid state, so there's no moving components. Therefore, you can switch the on and off state very quickly. Uh, so by putting five volts on the gate, um, you'll be able to connect, well, I don't know if that's really the right way to draw it, but you'll you'll be able to connect these two terminals uh, based on uh, that voltage. Um, the thing about transistors, or especially the MOSFET, is they only will conduct, uh, the, you can only switch the voltage one way. So if you have a voltage going from, you know, current 5 volts to, to 0 volts or ground or something, so you have current flowing, all right, you have current flowing from drain to source, uh, and these terminals will be specified for your specific uh, transistor. So you'll know from the data sheet what's the drain, what's the source, um, based on the pin order. Uh, but but from source to drain, it always conducts. So you you can't control it. So but so that therefore you have to put your relay or your your transistor in a specific way in your circuit that it'll only need to conduct from drain to source. Uh, in this specific case, and there's like, and and you know, n n type MOSFET and p type MOSFET, and there's, there's a whole bunch of other types of transistors, and um, some even solid, some there there are even such things called solid state relays. But the diagram I'm going to show, uh, in the way it utilizes the MOSFET, uh, it uh, it works, and it provides that switch. Um, uh, and um, if if any anyone has questions on this later, uh, please feel free to ask, uh, and I'm happy to kind of give a very basic explanation to help clarify. But basically, for for explicitly, we're using an n-type MOSFET today, uh, and the volt the the gate voltage is actually referenced to the source uh, voltage. So there has to be a common common ground in all these components, and uh, lucky for us in our circuit, there is a common ground. So we'll have we'll have the drain here. We'll have the source there, and we'll have this gate that sits out here. You'll see uh, when, when I when I show the circuit component, which has three terminals, um, and the gate is referenced. You know the 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 the, 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 the circuit that we're going to be using to drive the gate or the component is also referenced to ground. So that's that's not a problem. All right, so we'll go. To the next and drawing this a bit more distinctly we'll 
we'll join, join that circuit again. And so drain, source, gate and you'll see how all these line up and obviously the circuit diagram is not how you actually assemble things like in terms of where the pins are uh, it doesn't have so i'll actually show uh the circuit on a breadboard um so when the for an n type mosfet which is the most common type and i'll be showing i'll give you i'll give the pro, the product name and everything so if if you have it closed so basically it conducts when it conducts the gate source voltage is 5 volts and when it doesn't conduct, the gate source voltage is zero volts. Now, these, there's a bunch of different MOSFETs, and some close and open to different extents at different voltages. Some may take 10 volts to open. Some may be fully, sorry, to close. Some may be fully closed at five volts. Um, there's a, there's a, there's so many different uh, options, but I'll share the specific name. And I think once you have a circuit in order uh, and, and 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 using it, uh, you'll you'll kind of get an idea of where you need to go, what the critical parameter for your application is or your test circuit. Um, so how do we how do we provide that signal to the gate? So the gate gate signal. Now, if you wanted to kind of cheat a little bit, you could you could use a signal gen function generator, and I actually did use that for this experiment. Uh, it, it's a it's a you know we use a five volt square wave basically, um, but you could also use an Arduino microcontroller, and I actually have a video on this on YouTube uh, where there's a a function called Tone. Uh, for your Arduino market controller and you can actually get now the frequency steps aren't very precise They're like 200 around the 40 kilohertz range. It's like about 200 Hertz steps But if you uh, if you use this command in Arduino tone 2 meaning pin 2 and 40,000 which is 40 kilohertz um, Then you'll actually get a 5 5 volt square wave that you can use to drive a uh, a MOSFET in this case, so you could actually not avoid using a function generator although this function generator does I think have peak of I think peak 20 volts. So technically in this coming work, I'm using 20 volts to drive the transducer. So it doesn't make too much sense to use another uh, another device. Uh, I like to use like a, a MOSFET circuit because the power is not really necessary, but this is like mainly for teaching. The other thing is that um, I mentioned that the function generator can go to 20 volts. For this specific MOSFET, you can actually put up to a hundred volts here. So although I'll be driving today my, my transducer with 20 volts square wave, which is 10, uh, which is 20 volts peak to peak actually, because it's from zero to the maximum, you can actually drive this with 100 volts with the same exact circuit. Now you may need to beef up the resistor, uh, uh, but you would be able to drive with the same circuit, which is kind of neat to see you actually with a very simple circuit exceeding the capabilities of what you'd be able to do with a function generator alone, especially with the microcontroller. It's kind of even more, uh, um, it's even more uh, kind of satisfying to see that extra capability and just from kind of a, a very simple circuit. So let's let's talk about components um, for this specific device. Uh, so so there's a question. Uh, do I know any other options in a function generator to drive at frequencies uh, 40 kilohertz? Uh, so yeah, so there are um, um, so like I mentioned, there's there's the Arduino microcontroller, and I think just about any microcontroller will be able to provide uh, this um, <clears throat> uh, this signal, uh, this 40 kilohertz signal. If you want like a very um, so to provide more than 40 kilohertz, so it, it it like depends on the if you if you're thinking in terms of just the microcontroller, there's like the clock frequency uh, of the microcontroller, which is going to govern how precisely you're able to generate uh, frequencies. Uh, so there's specific microcontrollers which have what they call a numeric oscillator, uh, which can do very fine frequency steps. And it, um, it, uh, it, the, it, it will allow you to go like, I, in this video that I showed, I think I go up to like eight megahertz because the, or four megahertz because the clock, the clock cycles for turning off and on a, a pin. So, um, 
Now, in order to get a little bit of a kind of a frequency sweep effect, if you wanted to like change, shift frequencies, but uh, that may be, need more resolution. So you, you have to go probably with something a more specific um, uh, clock generator or or or, or frequency or pro programmable kind of uh, uh, frequency generator chip. There's also a lot of chips that have a voltage controlled oscillator on them. So you'd be able to set change voltages like and an analog like between zero and five volts. You can go between like uh, like let's say one you know 100 kilohertz and two megahertz or something so there's a couple of things there there's also like a um a, a chip called the 555 timer which is extremely common um uh you'll find a lot of videos and info on that <clears throat> they're also used for clock generators uh so or it's also used for uh it can be used for driving a transducer but it's used to for it's, it's used for timing um so there, there are a couple of options out there for higher frequencies in the megahertz or in the kilohertz even arduino can do kilohertz as i actually showed uh, in that video if you type in kind of arduino ultrasonic generator um you, you'll probably come up with my video but yeah you can ask more on that <clears throat> after um uh, in the q a yep um so here's a transducer it's it's a you know, this is a piezo pickup, um, and uh, it's basically a unimorph piezo bonded to a brass substrate. Uh, here is the, uh, I feel like I'm going a little bit long today. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, so here's the, the reading on, in terms of nano, 11 nanofarads. Here's a frequency sweep. Um, you see there's several resonant frequencies. The lowest is five kilohertz. The reason is because it's a, a very like compliant transducer with a thin piezo bonded to a brass disc. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit to make sure we finish on time. Um, so here's a transistor that we use. There's three terminals, like I promised: the the gate, the drain, the source. And the specific trans transistor is the IRF510. Um, it, it, you know, you see, it can do up to 5.6 amps at 100 volts. Um, I use these bigger two watt resistors. You can even use a higher two watt re higher wattage resistor depending on what you're driving. Uh, what your oh, main voltage is, power supply voltage. So, but it's 100 ohms, two watts. It makes it make sure it's larger. That's what's the difference between small and large resistor, uh, small wattage and large wattage resistors. I do actually include another resistor in the circuit, so I lied saying it's only two components. It's three, uh, but technically you don't need this one. So how about that? Uh, but I but I do use a 10 kilo ohm resistor as I'll mention. And as I already spoke about, you'll need an Arduino function generator, like basic stuff like a breadboard, wires, and oscilloscope, which is not really part of the circuit um, components. But this is the extra component, so I lied. I guess it's three components. Um, so what, what are you going to do? Same. So here's the circuit. But so there's that resistor. The resistor goes to the drain. So if you remember, if you if you if we drew that component, so here's that gate. Here's the drain. Here's the source. And here's the resistor. Um, here's the power supply. Here's our crystal. So the drain actually connects to the resistor here. And you would also expect, hey, the, the terminal of the crystal also connects to the drain, which is true. So here you have this red wire from the crystal going to the drain, that middle, kind of that middle uh, pin. And hey, the source, that will probably go to the ground, right? Yeah, that's true. And oh, the other side of the crystal, it also go to the ground according to this. That's true as well. And the voltage supply obviously connects to ground. So there's the kind of three wires that are needing to go to the ground side of the uh, uh, of the power supply. And this alligator clip is the power supply uh, of positive voltage. So here's what and um, here's what it all looks assembled together. So we have the we have the the source, which is all the uh, ground terminals. We have the drain, which is on the other side of the um, of the switch. And I put this 10 kilo ohm resistor here uh, between the gate and the source. Um, the gate and the source is already referenced uh, because the uh, because the function generator needs to also connect to the to the ground. Uh, but the reason I actually put a, a resistor here is the uh, is for any charge that gets developed on the on the gate because the gate is kind of like is also like a little bit of a capacitor. So that just makes sure that the standard state of the circuit is off because this because the 
charge that or the charging up that you do of the gate is going to be dissipated. So that's kind of an extra component there, uh, but you don't exactly need it uh, per se. Um, And here's another picture, and I'll be sharing. I'll be sharing this. Um, the, these 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 clips are the function generator. Um, the the alligator clips are are the power supply, and you have the transducer. And, and I'll be providing these to you uh, soon in an email, if you signed up for the webinar. Um, so here's our results. So I, I have a 30 kilohertz square wave. Um, you know, five volts maximum to zero volts um, at 30 kilohertz. And here's the result. You have, as I, as I promised, you have a time constant kind of on the front side, and you have on the off side, off side you have a very quick, there's still a little bit of a time constant, but there's a very quick um, uh, return back to zero volts. Um, and um, you have some oscillation happening in the circuit, I mean, in the crystal. Uh, or, or the transducer. Uh, this is at, these are both maxing out at 20 volts. So this is a different scale. This is a five volt scale. So this is the power supply at 20 volts. And this is actually the uh, 20 volts of the uh, blue, blue line. The blue line is 20 volts there. So it's actually does, it oscillates a little bit around. And the reason it, it is allowed to, uh, you, the reason the voltage is allowed to oscillate a little bit is actually because um, there is, there's a resistor here which blocks the power supply from dominating um, that voltage. So it allows a little bit of voltage fluctuation up and down, but then there's a little bit of return back and forth current from the power supply. Um, so there's a little bit of oscillation as you see kind of happening. Uh, and what's that caused by, you know, the mechanical oscillation of a transducer. So you're able to witness that. Um, so we're almost done now. Um, so here's what the power supply shows. Uh, it shows 20 volts and 0 0.104 amps. Uh, now you could use a wall power supply. You can get like a 20 volt, 20, you know, it's very common to find 24 volt DC power supply that you can just plug into your wall. You cut the leads off and you plug them into the, uh, the circuit instead of using this. But this is just kind of for laboratory experiments. You can use laboratory equipment, but if you were like implementing this in a real circuit uh, uh, and you didn't care about efficiency and you wanted to use this circuit, it's, it's well and good. Just find yourself a 20 volt volt power, uh, power supply, for example. Uh, so the, the voltage dissipate, I mean, the power dissipated is about two watts. And uh, almost all of the current is dissipated over the trans, trans uh, over the resistor, uh, because 100 ohms with 20 volts causes 200 milliamps. And on a 50 volt and a 50% duty cycle, we have 100 milliamps. So you could say four milliamps are caused by the transducer. Um, and, uh, uh, and the capacitive current on the piezo is actually like, it's very inefficient. So whenever you charge up and charge down a piezo ceramic, um, much of the current that's actually drawn is due to the capacitive behavior and not the, uh, not the displacement behavior or the piezoelectric behavior. So because there's a there's a ratio, you know, the coupling factor of the transducer, you're not really getting much movement, and that movement may not even be uh, only part of that movement is actually causing uh, work done on the external environment. Uh, so there is a you know you could calculate like you know input power, you know uh, input power. I'll just write W or oh P P is good. Uh, so, you know, output power versus input power or something like there's, 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 there's different equations, you know, 100% would be the best. Right now, we probably have less than 1%, but that's just because that's also because the type of transducer, there's ways to get more efficient. But right now we're focusing on can we deliver the voltage we want to the transducer? And you could, I, as I mentioned, with the specific transistor, the MOSFET that I designated, you could go up to 100 volts, which would not be something you could do with the power supply, sorry, with the function generator off the bat, uh, with, with such a simple, simple setup. Um, so I just wanted to give another kind of a, um, a consulting ad. Um, so for a circuit analysis, I, I found I've developed a product called the ultrasonic heartbeat. Uh, it's essentially a high speed a data logger, which is built off of a, of a USB um, uh, it's just built off of a USB uh, oscilloscope called the Picoscope. Uh, it's really great because it 
it's uh, it's compact and it logs all of the data. Uh, if you directly interface with the traditional oscilloscope, it'll take a long time uh, to. Uh, uh, you know, the seconds are more in terms of like 500 millisecond readings versus 10 milliseconds. Uh, and I have a lot of the things that you normally measure uh, already saved and output for you, like AC voltage, AC current, current voltage, circuit current, so you can calculate efficiencies, powers, phases, like whenever the frequency sweep happens, a lot of times in our, in our transducers, all that data will be logged and you can get like get a lot of value of data from this uh from this uh setup so if you're interested in this or in my other consulting services uh please uh let me know but with that i'll stop the recording and i'm happy to take questions so stop recording